Uh, okay, so in the class uh, leading up to now, we've been um, exploring uh, a number of types of, of modeling. And I'm going to go share my screen so you can, can be reminded of, of what those types are. Um, the first type of modeling we explored was, was system dynamics. Um, it goes by many other names um, uh, in terms of the mathematical formula, although system dynamics as a discipline brings additional philosophy and additional methodology for how you develop these models, often focusing on involving stakeholders on an, on an ongoing basis of models. But these sorts of models are traditionally articulated at an aggregate level. We'll see today that isn't always true. That isn't a, a fixed thing. But um, these models excel at characterizing the evolution of systems characterized by accumulation, those are the stocks and delays, uh, in the context of feedback loops. And we talked about feedbacks early on, you know, as having negative and positive feedback and a negative feedback with a delay could lead to oscillations. And when we built up these models of equations, we did so declaratively, sort of describing what we want to capture in the model. And um, feedback loops were kind of implicit in that characterization. And we could simulate it over time. And this sort of method excels in characterizing the dynamics of continuous systems, so particularly systems driven by feedback and accumulation processes. It's quite central to kind of even the philosophy of, of using stock and flow models. They're also very accessible to stakeholders. You can plop down one of these models in front of people, have a conversation with people who are experts in the area of the, uh, where, for which you're, you're building the model, and they can critique it. And remember what I said to you on the first days. Models are learning. There's, there's this widespread misconception that models are crystal balls that, that will tell us the future. And while it is true that models can give us some grounded expectations for what's coming, much more fundamentally, they're, they're learning tools. It's not that they tell us what is the case about the world, but they more quickly allow us to recognize when our thinking is off base because we represent it in a model. We show it to stakeholders and they say, ah, that isn't how it works. We, we take something that's normally in our head, our understanding of how our system is structured, and we take it out of our head and we make it explicit and put it in front of people, and they can critique it. And by critiquing it, they can update our understanding and, and sharpen, refine our understanding. That's modeling, but beyond modeling, ladies and gentlemen, Beyond modeling, we have simulation. And simulation goes beyond that by allowing us to run these models out and see what the logical consequences are. So if this is how you think the system works in the world, if that's basically a good characterization, what would it apply in terms of behavior in the world? And then we can compare its results against what we observe in the world. And if they're totally at variance, if they just don't job, if, they, if they're totally inconsistent, that also can allow us to critique our understanding. You know, wait a minute, our, our understanding just doesn't explain these cycles we see in the world or these, these patterns of really rapid change or what have you. And that forces us to refine our thinking. And system dynamics is actually very consciously advanced as a learning tool. And much of the philosophy I've just talked about of models as learning tools actually was, was infused by system dynamics early on. Now, beyond this, um, though we, we talked about other methods, other methods that are also dynamic modeling methods, like agent based modeling and just events. Agent based modeling. Also, is, is a model where you, you build a model and you simulate it over time. It can serve as a learning tool for much the same reason. You can get people to critique its representation visually. 
you can run it and see its behavior and compare that against the world. But with system dynamics, well, we could compare the behavior over time of the system. With database models, we can compare behavior over space and over networks and so on uh, much more readily over different scales of, of nested context. What's going on in a family? What's going on in a neighborhood? What's going on in a city? What's going on in a region? What's going on in the whole province or the whole country? We, we can kind of nest those concepts. And, and these sorts of models, agent-based models, often will focus on that interaction between an agent and their environment and agents and other agents. It's agent-based modeling, not in an atomistic sense of each agent isolation, like grains of sand, but how they, how they interact with one another. But agent-based models, beyond allowing us to characterize just agent dynamics, the evolution of agents, it allows us to link them together. We have networks, we have spatial context. And we also have individual level of histories that we can't get in an aggregate model like this. What this gives us, a system dynamics model gives us over time is a picture of at any one time, how many people are in this stock or this stock or that stock or that stock. We can run it forward in time. And we could again ask how many are in each of those stocks, but we can't really ask how many of the people that were here at the first time are now over here at the second time in general. We can't trace people's histories. And we can in agent-based models if we, we track people or we track agents over time. And, and that's a very important feature. Also, representation of heterogeneity. The fact that agents differ from each other in big ways, continuous ways, uh, or, or ways that are discrete, you know whether they were born in Canada or not, uh, versus their, some aspect of their height or weight, for example. Um, uh, age, if you consider that a static attribute, um, that can be captured in agent-based modeling much more readily than in, 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 that is at an individual level, much more readily than an aggregate level. We have to turn all continuous things into kind of chunks, like five-year age groups. And, and in general, the model size explodes. You may, may remember, I walked you through that, a little bit of the mathematics of it. And it's, it's daunting. If we, if we need to distinguish, you know, two categories, uh, Canadian citizens and others in a model, suddenly we've doubled the model size. We want to keep track of SIR for Regina versus Saskatoon, we double the model size. Whereas in agent-based modeling, we don't actually have to double the model size at all. Each agent can just store a, you know, an attribute which says which city they're in, a bit, a single bit, and we don't double the model size. It doesn't affect everything across the model which it does in system mining and aggregate system mining models. So agent-based models excel at representing heterogeneity, networks, space, behavior over time continuous as well as discrete differences between agents. All of these are, are readily represented in agent-based models. They capture stochastics in a way that's normally submerged in system dynamics models and allow us to explain why we see such variability in the world. All those are features of, of agent-based models that recommend it. But there's some things we could do with system dynamics modeling that we can never do with agent-based models. Currently, like we can solve for equilibria, figure out what are the points in which this model's in balance, where it's it's in this state of balance, right? It couldn't do that in age-based modeling. You know, how, how do you figure out at what point to be perfectly in equilibrium? This is it's not something that we're set up to do right now with how we specify age based models. Also, um, these can be more daunting for stakeholders to understand because there's all these different aspects of it, different places. And it's kind of hard for someone to look at it and say, oh, this model makes that assumption. No, that's off base. But it's right in the system dynamics model, it's up right in front of them. It's like, oh, because, because there's fewer building blocks. Here, there's a lot of building blocks and they're scattered around. 
the screen event modeling, like case based modeling, is an individual level prediction. You can capture differences between people, their behavior, or their experience over time, you know, their experience of care delivery in a hospital or what have you. But it specializes in representing resource limited workflows and people's progression along there and, and asking questions about resource availability and its impact on the system or resource placement on the system. We can ask all these questions about placement and availability of resources, how it affects throughput, the number of agents we can treat per day or entities we can treat per day, how long they're spent waiting, how long the queue is, um, the quality of service that they get or what have you. For all these things about service processes to make and discrete events and those, we can, we can ask those questions really easily compared to if we have to code it up all the way from the base with an agent based model. So these are three separate modeling traditions. Each of them has unique features. And I'm not even going into some of the additional ones. There's some, some additional features that um, one could refine this description. But the fact is that it's also misleading to show these as solitudes separated from one another. In terms of pedagogy, in terms of teaching, we, we sort of focus on each and isolate because we want you to understand each as an authentic tradition. But these days, there's not a need to, to do only one or the other. And in fact, much of the art of modeling now is when to do one and when to do another within the same modeling cycle. Maybe you build them side by side, but often within a given model, we'll have multiples of these. And I want to walk you quickly through some examples. Okay, um, weaving these together in a software pro a software system that's designed to do exactly that. A software platform called Anyways allows you to use any of these forms of logic. Okay, um, and to do this, we'll be calling up any logic and we'll be loading some models which I've posted on the Canvas site. So. If you don't have Canvas open and you don't have your computers up, uh, I suggest you know you might want to do so and follow along. Okay, so uh, while you're getting those those ready, maybe I'll make one or two further remarks here. Um, so. The system science methods, which I've just walked you through, contrasted the strengths of each. They're actually, in fact, highly complementary. More than that, they are synergistic. They actually strengthen each other. When I say it's synergistic, I mean the whole is greater than some of the parts. If, if you build a model with the right combination of them, often you can get out of it something you it's more than what you could have gotten by doing it in one and doing it in the other. You get something that, that has unique features. Um, each of these seeks to answer somewhat different questions. I mean, the questions are on resource related questions, often for discrete event simulation, quite different from what you're trying to elicit with an ancient based model, even though both are individual traditions. So, different depth from, from system dynamics. None of these replaces the other, and there are significant synergies. And what we're going to be exploring here is motivated by a realization in theory and in practice that these models put together, putting these models together in the same model, these types of methods together, I should say, in the same model, is really, uh, really important. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for this conceptually. Um, one is there are certain things it's easier to represent A versus B. If you're, if you're representing service delivery, where you need work, certain types of resources to proceed, man, that is so easy, so crisp, so elegant to describe in this great event simulation. You, you've got to be kind of Oh, odd to be thinking, no, I only want to do this in system. I only want to represent 
you know, stocks representing the amount of resources available and somehow write equations where it all depends on that and somehow deal with resource placement by having different parameters. It's, it's, it's very, very hard to imagine that it'll be obscure to stakeholders. Whereas if you do it in discrete event simulation, it just has that natural feel to it. Um, for those who want to download the models, they're in this area called example models and it's the lower bunch of them like the last six of them or so that are there that i've uploaded so one thing is there's a comparative advantage uh, for each of these um, things that are easy another is that you have different needs for analysis or outputs across different areas of the model um and in some areas you're interested in different questions than another so imagine Imagine we're really interested in understanding, um, you know, patterns of of uh, domestic violence, for example, within a broader population. Um, we might not rep want to represent everyone as an agent. We might really focus in on a population where there's also substance use issues involved. Uh, uh, individuals are are in. Um, uh, in a vulnerable situation um, and and represent a certain part of the population with greater precision. Or if we want to represent um, the spread of uh, SPIs, um, maybe maybe syphilis, we might want to represent certain certain subpopulations with greater greater detail. Or if we want to represent good example be childhood infectious conditions, uh, uh, measles. Um, uh, rubella, uh, potentially even pertussis. Um, maybe we want to put most of our attention on children, and we can have some representation of adults in as much as they uh, as represent they interact with children, but maybe not in as much detail. The third one is, I think, actually maybe the deepest point here: it's adaptivity. By the way, this is the sort of thing where knowing this, some of these would be be good for you uh, exam wise. Um, so adaptivity, the idea here is look, models are learning tools. I said it from this floor, not 10 minutes next. Models are learning tools. And as we learn, our sense of what we need in the model changes. Our sense of what's important in the model changes. I've asked you to, and I've posted links, to, to, to watch two videos, one on sensitivity analysis, one on calibration. And if you look at those, if you look at the one on sensitivity analysis, what you'll find is that you can analyze how a model's output changes as you change parameter functions. Models have these parameters, certain values in them, maybe it's contact rate, maybe it's the mean time they stay infectious before recovering, whatever it is. But until we do a sensitivity analysis, often we don't know how, how uh, variable is the model output? How sensitive is the model output? How much does it change as we change that assumption? And so this is another aspect of learning from models. We learn about the area, we learn about what's important to our stakeholders, we learn about where the model is sensitive. And that often makes causes us to change our decisions going forward. If we have a model where we can have multiple types of modeling, it allows us to say, oh, we really want to represent contact processes in greater detail. We need to represent needle sharing amongst intravenous drug users to capture the spread of HIV AIDS in Saskatchewan. So we can represent that with a model that allows for representation of networks. Agent-based modeling is an obvious example. Maybe we originally started it with a system dynamics model, an aggregate model, but then we kind of zoom in by implementing part of it, that part of it specifically using agent-based modeling. Um, and maybe there's a part of service delivery. Maybe you hear from your stakeholders that, look, a key thing affecting HIV AIDS spread is actually availability of of um, uh, heart, uh, so highly active uh, antiretroviral 
drugs that things that will keep the viral load levels down. They prevent a person from, from progressing onto AIDS from earlier stage HIV. They really enormously slow down that process and they prevent them from spreading it in the vast majority of cases. So if we want to represent that and how people need to seek care in order to have it, maybe we use the screen event model um, to, to capture that side of things. Um, maybe for representing stigma, we use agent-based models. So, so having the ability to adapt, to change what part is represented, what method, which of these three methods is used for each part of it is really an, an advantage. It turns out stakeholders often really resonate with some of these. If you have a doctor, if you have a physician, generally speaking, they're going to find a individual level formulation or it's easier for them to relate to because they're dealing with individual patients all the time that walk in their door that they have to prescribe medications to or, you know, or, or arrange for a procedure or give a uh, referral to another specialist or they follow them and their families over time. They're, they're used to dealing with, with individuals and that's often a motivation for using one type of modeling or another. There, maybe it's the stakeholder really interested in the geographic effects. So you say, okay, we need a modeling type that can represent geography from this level forward. And you have that ability. It turns out you can get great computational efficiencies by choosing the right method for the right piece of the model. For the population that you don't care about uh, representing in as much detail, because not that you don't care about them, they're just not as, as high risk. Maybe it's um, populations which have low risk uh, behavior with respect to spreading um, STIs. You represent them, sexually transmitted infections, maybe you represent them with a stock and flow model. But the ones with risk behavior, um, uh, you represent with um, greater levels of risk behavior, you represent them as agents. And finally, you can engage in multi-scale modeling. Have modeling within agents um, that is one type, maybe system dynamics within agents, and maybe agent-based between agents. Let's go, that's a lot of words. So it's a, it's a lot of ideas, but our group has identified five compelling patterns that come up again and again. And we're gonna walk through and look at models that illustrate these patterns, okay? Let's go do this right now. Um, so hopefully you have your, your any logic um, up right now. And I have to confess that I need to get my any logic uh, up as well. I had hoped that it was already running, but I, I, I am disappointed here. Okay, so give me just a sec here to make sure that I haven't already started it here. Um, and no, okay, awesome. Um, so we'll get any logic. Up. So we're going to go through several patterns in short succession. And I'm gonna to try to talk through some of the motivations for each, and we're gonna look at models for most, okay? Um, the first modeling uh, approach that we're going to use is going to weave together, as I recall, service delivery uh, represented discrete event simulation with, um, with, uh, with HMS modeling. Um, so here we have a population represented with agent-based modeling, and we have services which are represented using discrete event simulation. So let's let's go um, uh, let's go take a take a look at this. Okay, so I'm gonna go and open one of the models that I gave you. There should be one that's called, and I'm gonna have to remember its name here, but uh, it's called something like with lock-in effects. So um, here we go. And it's in hybrid models, multi-clinic SIS hybrid saturation effects and lock-in. You see that? I never forget that name. It just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Um, okay. Um, okay, so what is this model? Um, 
Well, what we'll see if we go to if we go down main is we'll see we have a a representation of a population, homes and clinics. Those are the agent population. That's kind of interesting. You got homes and clinics as, as agents. And there's some assumptions and parameters. Um, but I, at first blush, it doesn't seem anything uh, that unusual, but you might start to think, what, what is this clinic thing? Um, clearly, your population and, and, and home that's referring to a population out in the community. What's this clinic thing? Well, the clinic thing is a model that built. Anyone recognize this? What sort of model is that? Sweet event. So it's dealing with resource limited workflow and progress of entities to the resource limited workflow. Um, so you have these clinics, and these clinics are agents. There's a clinic agent, and then in Maine, there's a population of clinics. Okay, so I'm going to go run this model. Um, I'm running the baseline, okay? Um, kind of the default scenario. And there's actually some, some very interesting dynamics along with this, but you'll notice people starting, um, their colors can indicate infection status and their, some people in their homes are, are, are infected right there. Um, and uh, if we go and speed it up, they become, they become uh, further infectious and you're starting to see it spread. It's spreading between individuals and homes. And there's a spread process I won't go into in detail. What I wanna draw attention to here is this icon that looks like none of the others up here. Um, that sort of yellowish icon that uh, lies up here in mine towards the top. So I'm gonna go down to the clinic and there I can see in the clinic an operation of the clinic over time. Um, people are coming in and depending on how quickly they get service, they are actually going on getting treated and the treatment either is successful or it's a failure. If it's successful, it clears up their illness. Think about an STI. I know maybe you don't want to think about SDI, but think about an SDI. Okay. Um, and so if someone has chlamydia or gonorrhea, um, um, in order to clear that up reliably, they need to go to uh, to get treated. They need to be treated with antibiotics, and they can go to a sexual health clinic or what have you, and they can get treated there. Um, it's it's a fairly straightforward thing to do. Um, there's some big barriers to stigmatization, et cetera, and there's some very interesting issues about how to help people who, who don't want to go in because they're too embarrassed. But um, the fact is that they can get treated pretty reliably, and with a high chance, it'll be successful. It'll actually clear up their illness. And if we were to look at the rules here, what we would see is that when they get treated here, um, there's, uh, they can either be successful or unsuccessful. And what determines that is actually a, a certain probability of treatment success. But the mechanism by which this occurs in the model is you actually send an agent a message. If they, if it were successful, if it was successful, if it was a successful treatment, you send them a message saying, you are cured, okay? They, they are cured of their, rather painful malady. Um, and if you go to person, what you'll find is that characterized with a state chart and there's in fact two state charts. One for infection, spread and development. That state chart over here on the right. And then there's one involving care seeking, like going and, and wanting to get care, right? Um, this one over here for infection, um, there should be no surprises here. If you've watched those videos, if you've done assignment three, or if you've pursued this in projects, you'll recognize, what is this thing? Anyone, anyone wanna say, what's this link from susceptible to exposed? Yeah, someone's exposed to, in this case, it's an STI. It could be COVID for all you know, right? Or what have you. Um, they're exposed to chlamydia or they're exposed to gonorrhea or HPV or what have you. Um, and then after some period of time, 
they go from a latent state where they're infected, but not infective. Uh, they go to a state where they're infective and symptomatic. Um, and they have a certain number of contacts per day and they're sending messages to the contacts. So all that's to be fairly familiar, but what may be new is this link here, going back, what do you think this represents? If it's a link from an infective and symptomatic state to back to a susceptible, what does that represent? Well, no, it, it looks like waning of immunity. So that's, that's a good thought, Josh, but it's actually not waning of immunity. It's actually something, it's, this is not from the recovered state back to susceptible, from the infective state back to susceptible. So it's actually, right? Yeah, it gets cured. It gets treated. And there's a class of infections in the world where in order to get, get past it, actually, we need to be treated. So this one, these ones here are related to spread of infection. This one is related to cured. If they're sent a cured message, thou art cured, then, you know, now they're cured and they go back to a susceptible state. By the way, this is, think of from an old man. This is how, this is how STIs work. So you get cured, but that doesn't mean you're protected. You don't have long-standing immunity. You can get, you know, you can get gonorrhea two months from then really easily again. So it doesn't protect you for life to, to get it. Um, but it does cure, the, it does cure. It, it, it treats the bacteria and gets them out of your system. And, and you know, you can go, you know, as, as they say, you go to an SPI clinic and talk about gonorrhea of the face. You know, does it, is it like peeing nails right now? And, and if a guy says, yeah, he'll say, yeah, okay, you got, you got gonorrhea probably. Let's, let's get the test done. So, so this is where they clear that up. That they clear out the gonorrhea from the system, but but they stay susceptible afterwards. So um, this is a interface, though, methodologically between caregiving at the clinic. This is where they are successfully treated, right? They're sent this cured message, and that leads the person who's going through the clinic to get cured. Now, how do they go into the clinic? Anyone want to guess where that is in this model? Those who are poking around, where do you, where do you think? At what point do they go to the clinic? What would bring someone to the clinic? What do you think? Well, if, it, if, if you kind of get treated, right? If you have symptoms and so on. So it's probably going to be for people who are infected. Um, and what you'll actually find is that it's this one right here. It's so they're only going to go and start heading to the clinic if they're in the active state infected. That's what this guard is. The guard is basically, hey, under what conditions will this fire? And if it fires, they get the nearest clinic and they go to it, they move to it. They go to the clinic and when they arrive there, they're, they walk into the clinic. You can see it go here. And this is another key juncture between the two, between the agent-based modeling right in front of us here. And here, this nearest clinic dot walk in dot take, that's, that's speaking the lingo of discrete event simulation. That's this walk-in. So it's saying, hey, go into this workflow. So guess what? They arrive at the clinic because they were infected. We just saw that. They started going to the clinic, they eventually arrived there, and then they walk in and they start flowing through this system. They're still an agent. They're still circulating, you know, people, they can still infect people, but now they're also an entity in this workflow. And they come through, and if they're waiting too long, this is what this one is, they will balk. They will leave without being seen. They'll say, oh, man, you know, I've been waiting here for three hours, and I still haven't gotten, you know, testing, and it's getting close to, to closing time. I'm out of here, you know. Um, 
uh, I, I want to get back home. I'm, I'm hungry. Um, and they leave. So this is a, what's called a timeout transition. Um, and you can see the timeout is after five hours, 300 minutes. Um, by contrast, uh, if they're treated in a timely fashion, if there's a healthcare worker available to treat them, they can proceed on. So this is discrete event simulation, yes, but it is also agent-based modeling, yes. It's woven the two together. In the community, we have agent-based modeling. In the service delivery, delivery of services, we have uh, we have uh, a, a characterization that's based on discrete event simulation, that language. So here we've woven together these two types of modeling in a pretty transparent way. And when Josh said last time, I think it was Josh, that you know, these entities seem to be implemented as agents, this is what, in a way, this is what allows it. I said, you know, then when we get the hybrid model, that would be a real asset. Because it allows them to, to go into the cloud. And you know, the, the truth is, there's a lot of these situations. You know, you apply to graduate, you, you apply for a job, you are in the process of, of going to graduate school, you, you know, need to get a flight and, and you go through a bunch of steps to reserve it and, and get ready and, and go to the airport. There's a set of things where there's defined processes. But you also are circulating in the population and spreading it, just like they are here. They're spreading it among uh, among fellow agents. So this is a model that weaves together agent-based modeling on the one hand, and discrete event simulation on the other. We can crisply represent how people get treated and, and you know seeking care on the one hand, but also how they circulate in the community. So. That's an example of this first sort of, of, of modeling together, service, population, interaction. Um, I guess one thing I should, you know, should also note with this, if we were to go take a look at this while running it, we could do things here. Like we can add clinics, right? You can say, okay, I just press this button. I added another clinic. I can add yet another clinic here. And suddenly, you know, I can ask what if questions. So, so it's only, there's only one clinic, but there's actually three here. Um, but um, you know, I have I have uh, clinic zero, clinic one, and clinic two, for example. And I've I've added them, so I can ask about those sort of questions. How many clinics do I need, and how quickly do I have to deliver care? How if I add healthcare workers at clinics? I'm gonna add a second healthcare worker. I'm gonna add a third healthcare worker. How much would that help in terms of the population spread of this illness? You know, what do I need resource-wise to stop this bug from spreading? So instead of going up like this and staying up, what do I need to make it extinct, right? How many clinics do I need? How many staff at a given clinic? So we can do that, right? Here, I have three three clinics. I'm going to add a fourth clinic. Look, it's still staying in the population. Oh, there it went, disappeared. Um, I couldn't do that with just a discrete event simulation. How would I have the spread of infection and all that sort of stuff? I couldn't do it with just an agent-based modeling without a lot of work to represent care-seeking processes and people getting delivered and waiting in, in a queue of some sort for a, a nurse to treat them with antibiotics. But here you can do so really elegantly. Each component of this is elegant and fit for purpose. We have the ability to spread infection and have agents interact with each other and be in different environments, home or work or what, whatever it is. Um, but then we have the care seeking characterized and we can ask questions like how many resources do we need on the resource side to achieve things that normally are dealt with on the agent based side like spread of infection. Okay, so any questions about that particular model before we go to another model, type, another weaving together, any questions about that? Okay, so that was one 
compelling type of, of model. Um, I have a possibility for next week for one of the two final lectures for, uh, for doing a lecture on our Asian space model. The work did about the media. Um, I'd like to know are people interested in seeing that COVID 19 call? Want to see that? Okay, I'm seeing yes. Okay, either I will present it or Kurt Kruger, who's the day to day lead modeler with it, and it's just in an alternative. I don't know how to um, I, I, I'm just an advisor uh, to, to advise on uh, model evolution and, you know priorities for it and brainstorm about issues. He's the one sitting in a minute every week with Sakam Shahab and sitting in with with other members of the ministry and preparing the presentations to be shown and etc. And and God in the SHA. So one of he or I will deliver a talk next week, either Tuesday or Thursday on that. But what you'll find is that exactly uses this pattern. That pattern came out of earlier models that we built, but we use that as a central pattern for the COVID-19 model. Because people need care for COVID-19. Some need ICU care, some need hospitalization. A lot of the concern was, can we afford you know, that level of hospital beds that might be needed for this? And that, that model exactly uses this method we just saw. And it's elegant. It uses it as well for other things too. Testing process. When, when I want to get tested, well, PCR tests, you know, getting queued up for PCR tests. The testing processes in the pod lab, in the provincial lab, you know, testing samples from the north have to take longer. They take about two days normally to get tested. Um, uh, another one, contact tracing processes. That's a resource constrained workflow, right? Like. You're not going to get traced until this contact tracer who is available to interview you and attract your contacts. And they're going to have to wait to be interviewed or tested until a contact tracer can deal with them. The point is, this is a beautiful example of how, how this interaction works. Okay. So, no fuss, no muss, uh, quite straightforward in any logic. Partly because we push them to make it straightforward. Um, it used to be a lot more painful. Okay. Next, um, I'd like to talk about this one. This next one is about zooming in on a part of a population. The idea here is conceptually simple, but rather elegant as well. It is often with a lot of modeling, our interest is in a certain subgroup of the population. I stood for you uh, and on this floor. Uh, about nine days ago, maybe it was last, no, it was last Thursday, so a week ago, from this very place, I talked with you about scale free networks. Do you remember with scale free networks? There was an idea that the tail wags the dog. A small number, a small fraction of people in the population, maybe it's commercial sex workers, who are often, you know, grievously uh, mistreated and suffer stigmatization and can't get proper care in many societies. Maybe, maybe they're forced into situations where, you know, unsafe sex, um, they're not given access to, uh, to, to appropriate uh, resources to, to avoid spread of infection. Um, and, and those individuals, may um, maintain a spread of infection in the population that would otherwise go extinct. If you look at the behavior of the average population member, do you remember that? That if you look at the average population member, they have few partners, but some people have to, you know, are, are involved with hundreds. And, it, and maybe people who are, you know, abused in, in positions of, of, um, of uh, vulnerability. Um, and and uh, in our in our grievously abused because of that. So we may be really interested in a certain segment of the population that's at risk, a certain segment that's vulnerable, a certain segment that lives in crowded housing, or that is 
limited access to health care. Think about the US undocumented immigrants. They, they don't have they don't have health insurance like that, you know. Um, and in some states they can't even get a driver's license, but they have to drive because they can't afford to live here or the place to work. And, and those populations often are the ones at risk with respect to you know uh, adverse outcomes, with respect to health issues, etc. There are foremost risks. And the rest of the population, we may be interested in, partly because they can become at risk, maybe they lose their job and, um, and they become homeless, maybe they're subject to battery at home from an uh, intimate partner violence, and they end up on the street and, and seeking help in a shelter, and, and they end up being trafficked or whatever. But the point is, we want to represent something about the general population. We don't want to say that it's not relevant. It, it is relevant because people can end up, you know, um, shifting down here. But our foremost interest is in this aging population at risk. It's the individuals who are most vulnerable, who may sustain the infection or may, may um, be subject to exploitation, et cetera, who may be at risk of HIV AIDS, et cetera. So it's this population that we want to zoom in on. And the idea is let's zoom in on this. But still keep this at a high level, like stocks and flows. We see what it represent this. We can just keep track of people as numbers here, you know, count the people on each of these. That's important. But when people reach a certain part of the risk continuum, maybe it's becoming homeless, or maybe it's you know getting involved in illicit drug use, or maybe it's starting with opioid prescriptions or recreational use of opioids. They they reach a point in the risk continuum where we say, okay, let's let's represent them as a full person and follow them as a full person. That's the idea here. We still represent the dynamics here, but not in as much detail. And you may say, well, how does this work? I mean, we have some oh, agents mixing with stocks and flows, but let's go see how it works. It's not that hard to do. I mean, you're a computer scientist. Come on, um, we can do this. It's, it's not that hard. Uh, so let's go see how it's implemented. And to see this, I'd like you to open up the model called budding hybrid. Um, okay, budding hybrid model. I'm referring not to Billy Bud, but to a model that where people bud off as individuals from a, from a stock. So I just opened it. It, it stands before us in a most, in a most modest fashion. So this is, you know, a rather uninspiring little model, but it, it illustrates the point mechanistically. So we have uh, a population that maybe is of, of less risk, and then we, once people are diagnosed with diabetes, we actually represent them in greater detail. But actually, we have a model for Saskatchewan that looks like it's going to be adopted by the provincial modeling team for end-stage renal disease and, and Chronic, uh, chronic kidney disease and uh, transplants and dialysis for, for diabetics, uh, uh, for diabetic individuals. And indeed, we have a whole representation of non diabetics in terms of weight categories and ages and so on. And once they reach the diabetes state, we can represent them as individuals. And then we follow them as individuals. And most don't develop very serious chronic kidney disease, but those do, that do, we can follow. It's a much smaller segment of the population. So let's run this. Let's run this. Here's a model. We have the non-diabetics and they're gonna bud off into individuals once they get to a diabetes state. So let's let's go run it. And you'll see visually, you know, some some stylized indication of what's going on. Oops. Hey, come on. Where the oh man, where'd that go? Um I I, I panned up. Okay. There we go. Okay, so here's non-diabetics, and when they flow down here, they immediately turn into agents who are added as these circles. Okay, these circles are are individuals. Let's if 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 that doesn't capture your imagination, let's go over to this panel and let's go look at the population here. Okay, um, this is a population of agents: agent zero, agent one, agent two, agent three. These are just different agents within the population, but there's still a population of non-diabetics that's not agents. They're 
their count, their count of people who are non-diabetic. So what I'm saying is that we have turned this flow into a budding machine. And we're seeing that turns people into agents once they flow down. How is that actually accomplished? Well, it's what it lacks in elegance, it makes up for in utility. So if we if we go look at this, um, this is just a standard standard flow. The number of people flowing down here is the number of non-diabetics divided by the mean time to develop diabetes. Nothing unusual there, nothing to look at there. Where it actually turns more interesting is this thing create agent trigger. So what's going on here? Well, there's a little bit of finesse. So there's a condition on this that we see to the right. So basically it says, look, when this stock gets above one, go through some work to butt off a person. Basically this stock here, this here stock shown in magenta or anything, that stock is representing people waiting to be individuated, to be budded, to be created as agents, right? When there's more than one person, we go and we kind of get the integer number of people to be created, the floor of this. So if this was 3.141592, um, this would turn into three, right? If it was 2.71, they would turn into two. Um, and then we loop through the agents to be created. We add them to the population. This is how you add agents in, in any logic to a population. If this were called pop, it would be add under bar pop. Um, and then we decrement, hey, we remove this many agents uh, from there. We turn them into people. So we remove them from the stock. We just subtract it from the stock. And then we go and we say, okay, get this event ready to fire next time again. Just you know, set it up to fire. Set it up to, to, to fire off the next time this is greater than one. So what's going on is that basically we've turned this conceptually into a situation where people start as, as numbers in a stock, but once they reach a certain point, they're individuated. They turn into individuals with histories and who can have networks and be geographically located and, and can be followed in terms of their interactions with others. A very simple idea, but a really powerful idea. And you may be surprised or not to know that this too has been enshrined in our COVID-19 modeling. Um, so in the summer of 2020, when you folks were just emerging from the first lockdown um, with the provincial government saying, you know, time to reopen Saskatchewan and we moved beyond COVID and, and Saskatchewan is open for business again and, and all that that's sort of empty sort of comments um uh wasn't wasn't planned out using all the resources because they didn't want to be told that you know this is this is uh an advisor um uh, and it led to all these outbreaks and and the uh, and Clearwater and uh, the colonies in the south, etc. This model was starting to be used for the SAJ to plan their capacities. How many PPEs you know, the masks and, and full body suits, and gloves to order. To what degree they should, um, are, are you know, how will chronic disease likely affect the spread of uh, COVID and nineteen and the hospitalizations from it in the north and different regions of the province. And so a student of mine, Yuan Qian, who's quite famous in this province for, for her superior modeling in other areas as well, um, built up an age, sex, and risk factor structured model of this sort. So these areas upstream were captured as age, sex, and, and chronic disease sort of uh, stratified. And then once people reached a certain point, um the point was they got infected with COVID-19 um we were I was advocating it should probably be when they get 
um, to be in contact of someone with COVID-19. I think that would actually be more interesting we could simulate contact tracing in the model. But um, the model had it as when they get infected, they get turned into agents, and then they flow through. What does this look like? You know what I want to say? What does that look like? What sort of modeling tradition is that? The screen event. They flow into the hospitals and she had representation of the six provincial hospitals. And they flowed into there as agents. And they stayed as agents, as I recall. After that, um, they would stay as, as agents in the model. And so here we have system dynamics used for the broader population, really, uh, you know, age, sex, et cetera, stratified, but low. Um, low resource demands associated with it. Turning to agents whose interactions we could follow that are in certain regions of the province, we could situate them geographically if we wanted to. And then I followed this discrete event. Um, and guess what? Their characteristics here, like the chronic diseases, translate into the characteristics of age. Their age category turns into an actual age in the agent population. Um, you know, they're, they, they are uh, made more specific, basically. Um, so this model was used in four months. If you were following the, the sort of briefings, this is the model behind it. Um, You're following the capacity planning and the sort of scenarios for what might play out in fall of 2020. This was the model. Another of these models, which is tripartite as we call it and it's all three types of modeling involved and you had built it uh quite quickly and she was able to parameterize it draw on data about chronic disease prevalence in different regions and exactly nailed a lot of the patterns that we saw emerge um you know with with different rates of hospitalization say for the north and the south because of chronic disease risk because of the history of colonization and other factors involved um, that's left with with poor poor quality housing and uh, sedentary uh, lifestyles uh, because uh, previously wandering lifestyles were, were more or less uh, forced out of it and less availability healthy foods etc okay we're going to talk now about system dynamics driving agent evolution um and here, th there's a couple ways agents come together with system dynamics. We've just seen one where they're budded off. But another way is you can have agents with, within them have system dynamics evolution, characterizing behavior with respect to continuous quantities. Maybe it's weight gain, maybe it's immune system strength, maybe it's aspects of stress and stress response. So let's go. Let's go open a model like that. So in the hybrids area, if you look there, there's actually a bunch of them. There's an opioid model which illustrates this. Maybe the one that shows it most graphically would be this one, a CTL state variable. Um, I can't remember if I posted this flu amino epi, but uh, that was also interesting. But this CTL state variable has a very simple representation of this. What I'm about to show you is kind of, um, a, a very cutting edge thing. We we did some of this back in about 2007 through 2009, quite a bit. Modeling what is called the immunoepidemiology model. So we, we characterize spread and effect of infection in the population, but we characterize people's immune response within a person. And the idea is, as we know with COVID-19, an infection is not an infection, it's not an infection. If someone has weaker immune system or immune system that's naive to COVID-19, um, they're a frail elderly person, or they're on immunosuppressant drugs. Um, if they're, they have rheumatoid arthritis and they're taking, uh, you know, a, a corticosteroids uh, to treat it, um, then their protection level against infection is much less. And it, and it, uh, and it matters. Why does it matter? Matters to their yeah, responsible agent. Matters to how long they'll stay infected and spreading, um, the severity of the symptoms. And so, one way to characterize this is to build on a really neat literature that actually characterizes 
dynamics of infection within a person using essentially stocks and flows or very different systems. So here, what we have is a couple of different problems. This V is representing free virions. These are like viruses floating around in the blood. X is uninfected cells. Think about them maybe in the esophagus, for example, um, or in the lungs. Y is infected cells here. And Z down here is immune memory. This is about as simple as they get. This is like the simplest form of these models. These days they're actually quite sophisticated. And I have colleagues here in Canada, very close colleagues, who have built wonderful models like this with many more state variables for COVID 19. And you have, if anyone has any bad biology background or taken any of the courses which get into immunology, there's there's a bunch of things like precursor cells and effector cells and cytotoxic T lymphocytes and neutrophages and macrophil macrophages and neutrophils, et cetera, that are different types of cells. And there's a dynamics to it. It's actually very well described by a stock and flow model like this. But this is a stylized one. And this is based on a book called Immune Dynamics. Um, uh, and here we're going to run this model okay um so we're going to run this one called high fatal viral threshold so let's run that high fatal viral threshold here um and we'll go and simulate it so these are individuals um located in in networks and each of these individuals has this immune dynamics and when they get infected their viral load level will will rise. So, so basically, um, uh, if they get infected, they get virions here, and these will end up affecting through these new infection cells to get infected cells. And when cells are infected, they will stimulate the immune response, which tries to catch up. And basically, early on in COVID nineteen infection and influenza and infection by measles. Any number of different viral infections. There's this viral dynamics where you know the, the virus is multiplying really quickly in you, and then your body's struggling to build up its complement of immune cells to, to take it on. In this case, cytotoxic T lymphocytes, which are which are these cells that will try to hunt down infected cells. And there's natural killer cells and other types, B cells versus T cells, B cells have some immune memory. And basically these cells will start killing off, that's this death by CTLs, the infected cells. And so a person I show here as uh, the, the kind of the radius here, that's gonna indicate, as I recall, their level of immune memory, the redness will indicate their level of virus. So this is someone who's largely recovered but this is someone they've infected, right? And man, this, this one got really, really red. That indicated a high viral level. And the beauty of it is we could make each person have different strengths of immune response. So some of these individuals might be, for example, um, vulner, particularly vulnerable individuals, like they, they're on immunosuppressants or they're, they're elderly. Um, uh, they, maybe they have a chronic disease that, that it's like chronic kidney disease that, that puts them at risk. Um, maybe they're on uh, eczema drugs, which, which are, uh, involve corticosteroids sometimes and, and end up putting their immune system at disadvantage. But what we're seeing is a, a spread of infection where some people get more heavily infected than others and they spread it to others. Now, what's not so obvious is that within these dynamics, you can get repeat infections, for example. But you'll notice that sometimes there may be a bit of a change in network. So I'm going to switch here. So this is showing people's immune responses and viral loads evolve as they expose each other. Let's go. Let's go though. Go look at this. Um, that was high fatal um, fatal viral threshold. The idea is what level of virus in your system do you need to kill you? Let's go look at one where it's it's lower. Okay, um, it's a lower threshold needed to kill you. 
So here, some of the people are actually killed by the infection and it disconnects them from the network. And by disconnecting from the network, you get the inability for the virus to, to spread within the network. So how do we capture that? Well, it's, it's very easy in any logic. This is a hybrid model. Here, this is within a person. We're having these dynamics. But over here, oh my gosh, this is a state chart. And you might be excused for saying, I didn't know you can put those next to each other. Well, of course you can. This is any logic, of course. So here, once, once their viral load goes above a certain thing, they, they die. They're removed from the population. But otherwise, they're living. Kind of a dichotomous um, grim view of existence, but the idea is that they're killed off if their viral load goes too far. So you can, you can capture that in this sort of model. Um, there's actually several other models um, that are also reminiscent of this that I did post. Um, so if you were to look at like environment contamination hybrid, now this is something that will speak to you like no previous generation. Um, so here we have homes, persons, and workplaces. And guess what? Each workplace and each home has a pathogen reservoir. Think aerosols or think surfaces that are contaminated by COVID-19, by COVID or maybe they're contaminated by normal virus or contaminated by, by um, MRSA, MRSA, methods of resistance to Philococcus aureus. So these are, these are bugs that can live on surfaces or live in the air for, for aerosol rates which could infect people. And the idea here is that each person who's infected sheds pathogen into this, and breathe out aerosols, right? Um, or, or by talking, they, they cover it in some surface. And then over time, that deactivates. But the idea is that people get sick too. Like this is just living in the environment and home or workplace, but then there's people getting sick as well. And people can get, sick from the environment um and they could pick it up from the environment and once they do so they're in a shedding state and they start to shed it into the environment wherever they go and it can spread more um and there's some state chart associated with whether at home or work at different times so so let's go let's go run that um i'm going to run this medium population i'm conscious of the time here um, but, but here we go and we have people at homes and we have workplaces and remember homes and workplaces have these environmental reservoirs. And what we're going to see is, um, people's color change depending on when they get infected. Um, and people move to workplaces during the day. And you'll notice that one of these squares is not like the other. Can anyone see that? Uh, you can't really see it, but these two are actually colored here with red, and that's indicating uh oh, there's a there's an environmental reservoir. Go, uh oh, look, look, this home is infected, and they're shedding here. Look, it's turning red, right? They're shedding. This this redness indicates how high that reservoir level is. It's infected all those, and guess what? They go to work. And guess what they do at work? Those infected people. What's going to happen at work? They spread more infection at work. And guess what? Those people at work are now, some of them are going to get infected and they're going to go home. They're going to bring it to other homes. And you got this pulsating effect, right? Um, they go home, they can bring it home. If it spreads from someone else at home, they can bring it to their work and then it could spread more. This is what happens with <clears throat> schools. It's what happens with workplaces in general, et cetera. So here we have these reservoirs of infection captured with stocks and flows. Uh, and we have a language of agent-based modeling to allow us to have the infection spread. So this is an example also of stocks and flows interacting, interacting with, um, with uh, agent-based model. There's no discrete event simulation here. It's just, it's just those two. Um, 
Now, time is, is moving on, but we've gotten through most of these. Um, there's one we didn't get to, which was spatial layout of light. You said like, here's the mosquitoes, these are people, and then there's birds. And in a sort of spread from, from one cell to another, the birds and the mosquitoes, the birds bite the mosquitoes, or oh, sorry, <laughs> that would be interesting. Some birds do bite mosquitoes, but the mosquitoes bite the birds and they pick up the West Nile infection and then they can spread it to other birds or to humans. Um, but uh, the birds, uh, they could bit, get bitten by West Nile infection. Uh, in fact, a mosquito can get West Nile to very high levels and then they can get it, you know, other mosquitoes will pick it up for them. And you can see the birds fly between these areas and the mosquitoes diffuse and basically the infection will spread. We don't have time to go into that. Um, okay, um, there's uh, one or two other ones I want to show though, and, and we probably will have to make do with just one here. Um, so there's a model that I think you should also find in there that's called something like basic health economics model. It's one of the, the last one, and it's called in a rather strange term. I think it once meant refactored, but someone called it refected, um, and it's not a, a reinfection. Okay, so here's a model illustrating what's called health economics. Basic idea: we have a population of agents, persons, and the agents go through some types of health conditions. There we go, um, with respect to diabetes and diabetic uh, chronic kidney disease. There we go. But in Maine there's actually stocks and flows which are accumulating things. And some of these should remind you of things you've become out of, like life years lived by the population. Is that an idea of something in assignment two? Yeah, yeah, it's over IOU. So this is super fun. Like how many economists deal with this all the time to say, how many life years lived will we save if we invest in Making, you know, making um, insulin uh, free at no cost, and and diabetic testing cert free at no cost for the entire population. You want to know, like, not just how long, not just uh, are you saving lives, but how many more lives, how many more years of people live it um, over time, and in, in the next hundred years, how many lives here, how many years would people have lived cumulatively? With this investment and without, and, and that gives a sense not only of how many people are living at any one time, but, but you know, cumulatively, how many extra years you've let them live. And then there's this thing called qualities, quality adjusted life years. And the idea there is, as the head of the WHO said, it's important to not only add years to life, but life to years, to add quality to years. And you can capture that, capture the fact that gossip when you make people healthy. They're going to have more fully adjusted life years accrued than if, if they get sick. We can we can value keeping them healthy, for example. And then there's some costs you can accumulate. So the idea here is, is rather simple. You know, you have a population, they're circulating and they're 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 developing these health states. Oh, 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 okay. So there's a there's a bad, a bad thing. Um okay, that's uh Person and mumble. Um, so, so what's going on here? Normal glycemic cannot be referenced from an unknown case label. Okay, well, um, maybe the refected version, <laughs> maybe the refected version is not the version we wanted. Let me see if the non refected version works. I'd rather have a non refected. Thanks. Um, so, let's just, let's just see if this works. Here we go. Um, I'm going to run the baseline and We'll see if, okay, it was the refection that was bad. Okay, that's, that's not so good. Um, okay, so we have a population circulating. There's a bunch of people in the population, a thousand people in the population, and each person is in a certain state here, which has a cost and a quality of life associated with it. And we go back and, and these stocks are accumulating it up across the entire population. So it's kind of figuring out, okay, what, how many people are alive right now? And, and, and this is integrating up, which is summing up over time, the 
number of people alive right then. This is summing up over time the quality of life of those people, which can be elicited in, in certain ways um, uh, for, for different qualities of life that they might have in each of these states. And, um, and these things are accumulated the costs that are born to them in those states. So here we're using stocks both to like summarize aspects of the population, outcomes of the population. It's a simple idea, but it's actually uh, an idea that can get um, very, very useful. Um, where am I? Where, where's my, where, oh man, uh, here we are. I think, oh man, um, I, am, I am confused. Where are my slides? Here they are. Um, so it can get actually quite useful if you have like an ancient population, just like the Asians, biggest tobacco company trying to get kids to start using tobacco or start vaping or what have you. And you can see that agents driving a stop the flow off, or maybe this is some aspect of, of, of uh, companies polluting, and this is pollution and environment. You can capture this quite readily with a model by mixing agents on the one hand and stocks and flows on the other. Um, and finally, you can have aggregate system dynamics derives agent population. So maybe the system dynamics is like. Um, spread of West Island birds and mosquitoes. And imagine the madness, ladies and gentlemen. You would be uniquely suited to understand this when I give talk, even in Australia or, or the US, people will understand. It would be madness to try to model each mosquito in Saskatchewan and Asia, don't you think, in the summer? It'd be madness indeed. So like, we can measure, we can. Model as we do in our COVID nineteen model, as in person as a as a as an agent. So you have persons as agents, and you have mosquitoes and birds. We'll represent them with stocks and flows, and that'll interact. And a mosquito can bite a person, and could send them to the hospital with West Nile if it's a an individual with chronic disease or or weak immune system, etc. So um, we can easily capture that uh, within a model such as this. So. Um, I hope I've uh, given you a glimpse of some frontiers here involving hybrid modeling, the mixing together, mixing and matching of these different types of modeling, where you're using different modeling approaches for different areas of the model, care seeking versus circulation of bug in the population, um, buildup of reservoirs, you use each one, use the right language for the job. That's what we can achieve with meta-linguistic instruction, picking the right language for the job. Okay, um, that's all we have time for today. I will be working to get us a lecture, either by myself or Kurt Kruger, on the, uh, the Saskatchewan COVID-19 uh, hybrid model. Um, which makes use uh, most notably of, of agent-based and, uh, and discrete event components, okay? So thank you very much. Um, mind the, the assignment.